Good morning, everyone. How you doing this morning? It's Tuesday. It's only the beginning of the week. We've got three more days from today. Spiritual emphasis week. So how many of you still have the sheet saved? Some of you guys still got it. Some of you guys came with the Bible. How many of you came with the Bible? All right, you get a special prize. We'll talk after. <laughs> I'll give you a big hug. <laughs> All right, so A, we're on A. What was yesterday the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ? That was S. Knowing his name, knowing who he is, understanding the glory of Jesus. And today, we, I want to talk about being accepted by God. So we're going to start in the same passage, which is Philippians chapter 3. And so I think there's a verse up here. Yeah, Philippians 3, 9. But we'll read 8 and 9, and I think you can actually go to the verse on, in the slides. So Philippians 3, verse 8, it says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And then verse 9 says this, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. And if anything defines the Christian faith or what it means to be a Christian, this idea of righteousness by faith is that thing. And so that's what we're going to really focus on right now. Now, what does righteousness mean? Righteousness means to be right in right standing with God on the basis of the Mosaic law. God revealed his laws through Moses. Many of us know the Ten Commandments, right? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make idols. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness and lie against your neighbor. You shall not covet. So those are the, that's the standard, and there's more, but that really encapsulates the standard by which God, through the prophets, brought his standard, his rules. And when those rules came, essentially what happened is we realized that we are in trouble <laughs> because when the law encounters the human heart, when the, when the law encountered people, we realized that we're sinners, now, Paul, and, and again, uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 says, sin is lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. That's what sin is. Paul tried his whole life to beat sin by being a Pharisee and by obeying God's rules. And even in this passage, we'll look at it in a second, but he says, I was blameless when it came to this law of, of Moses. But, you know, he also recognizes his sin. He, he talks about the sin in another spot. And so I want to, he talks about his, him being a good person and the recognition of all his bad stuff that he did in his life too. And the recognition of his bad stuff uh, is in 1 Timothy if you have a Bible, you can read 1 Timothy, but I'll read it for you if you don't have it. It's 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. It, I want you to just kind of hear what he's talking about sin is here. He says, now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and the sinner, for the unholy and the profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for sexually immoral people, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, 
perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. So he kind of lays out, he goes, these are just the things that we understand are sin. These are lawless things. These are things that are sin before God. But then verse 12, he says this, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful and he appointed me to his service. Though formerly, see, he goes, formerly I was one of those things that I just identified. Now some of you go, oh wait, I might have struck my father or mother. I might have been, I might have lied. How many of you guys have told a lie ever? No, you're supposed to lie. Just keep your hand down. Don't, don't out yourself like that. Just kidding. And Paul says, I was there. He says it right here. He goes, though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed. Everybody say grace. The grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Now, if we go back in Philippians, Paul goes, okay. And now he acknowledges, like, ultimately, I was a blasphemer because I resisted the gospel. I was so caught up in my worldview. I was so caught up in my religion that I even persecuted Christians. You know, Paul was there when they stoned Stephen to death. Stephen was an evangelist in the early church, and he was preaching about Jesus, and they stoned him to death. Paul was standing back overseeing what was going on. And so he's literally like, he goes, I am one of those murderers. You know, those people who God said, you shall not kill. I was one of those people. But God showed his mercy to me. But here in Philippians, it's really interesting because if you go to chapter 3, verse 4, as we're looking at Philippians 3, 8, and 9, and Paul's saying, I'm counting everything as lost for the excellence of knowing Jesus. He's not talking about the shameful things. He's actually even talking about all the things he could have pride in in himself. Because even his good deeds are like filthy rags. When he comes into the presence of God, he goes, all the good things, it, the good things that I do for God, they turn into pride in my life. And they actually end up being sin. Look at what he says here. He goes, though I myself has, have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was of the people of Israel. I was of the tribe of Benjamin. So he goes, my tribe, my people, my custom, all of that, I was the best. He goes, I was a, the he a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law of Pharisee, and the Pharisees were strict religious leaders. And he goes, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, I was blameless. But whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. He goes, okay, so I, ha I was a sinner, and I recognize that I'm a sinner. And I had these shameful things, but it's not just the sh shameful things I give up. It's also the things in myself that I could boast in, my own works that I think can justify me and make me right with God. Even those works that I considered good, all the things I had pride in, my tribe, my, you know, my standing before people, he goes, all that I consider as loss to know him. Because none of those things will make me righteous before God. What's, what's happening here in Philippians 3.9? There's a powerful story in the gospel. Jesus is at a house of a Pharisee, just like Paul was a Pharisee. You know, one of these religious leaders invited Jesus to come over, and there Jesus is at the house. And there he's reclining at the table, and they're eating together. And it says a sinful woman, this is in Luke chapter 7, we're going to turn there in a second. Actually, you can just turn there, so we're there, Luke chapter 7. A sinful woman, it says she was sinful, she came into, that, into the house where they were. Now probably, maybe this was Mary Magdalene, there's another passage where it talks about this woman who was demonized, she had been with, you know, so many men, and she had lived an immoral life, and she had done things that, that were, you know, shameful, and, and most likely she herself was abused by men. And that was what was going on in her life. And so here she is, this sinful woman. Maybe she was into alcohol and all this kind of drunkenness and drugs or whatever. She was living that whole life. She was messed up. And she is about to be stoned. And Jesus 
looks at all the people around her and says, the one without sin cast the first stone, lifts her up. He delivers her of demons. He forgives her. She walks away from that experience just like, what just happened? She encountered Jesus, the mercy of Jesus. Well, here, that's the woman, probably. And so she comes into this room, and here you have these religious men, and what happens? She, it says that she takes this alabaster flask. She takes this oil, which, you know, probably worth so much money to her, and she breaks it, and she starts to wash the feet of Jesus with this oil, and then she starts to weep at his feet, and she starts washing his feet with her hair. And there, this woman, she had been encountered by the mercy of God. And what happens, you know, what happens in the room is that the Pharisee, the religious man, he looks at what's going on, and it says something interesting. It says he thought something in his mind. He goes, if this man, Jesus, was a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is. She's a sinner. And then Jesus knew his thoughts, it says in the passage. And so he looks at his disciple, Simon. He says, Simon, I have something to say to you about this event, which was making everybody uncomfortable. The religious guys, I mean, everybody's like, what is going on here? That Jesus would associate, he would allow this. Doesn't he know what has been in this person's life, the sin? It says in verse 41, a certain moneylender, well, Jesus said, Simon, I have something to say to you. This is what he says to Simon. He says, a certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. So one had 500 debt, one had 50. And this is what sin is like in our life. And this is why we can never earn our way to heaven through our works, because we, there's too great a, a debt that we owe, a payment that we owe. Our sins are too great, and so it's impossible to pay the debt back ourselves. And Jesus says, which one, which one will love him more? What do you, what do you guys think? The guy forgives 500 denarii and 50 denarii. Which one of those two will love the person more who forgave their debt? The one who forgave 500, right? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turned toward the woman. And he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. From the time that I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who are at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this? that can even forgive sins. And he said to the woman, listen to this, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. What's so incredible about this passage is that it is confronting that pride of the religious leader who thinks that by his good works he can earn his way to salvation. Who is justified, the woman or the religious man who looks at the woman and goes, oh, you, you can't touch that person? That's what's happening in Philippians. See, Paul realizes, I'm the Pharisee. And he goes, I recognize and I give up all that. You know, the woman, amazingly, the woman so touched by the mercy and forgiveness of God, she takes everything that she has you know, that alabaster ointment was probably worth about a year's wages. She takes that year's worth of her life, and she goes, it's nothing to me. I break it, and I give it to Jesus. That's what Paul says in Philippians. He goes, I count everything as loss just to know him. And to, to what? To have a righteousness that comes from him, not my own righteousness. Not my own righteousness. 
but righteousness that is through faith in Jesus. This is the gospel, you guys. Righteousness is available to us apart from what we do for God. The gospel says this. The gospel says, it does not say be good so that God will forgive you. It says God will forgive you because he is good. God offers you salvation and forgiveness because he is good. He's merciful. He's full of loving kindness. And how does he forgive us? It says in Philippians, because we're kind of focused on Philippians here, Philippians 2. Look what it says in verse chapter 2. He says in verse 5, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, he didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. So he was everything that God was. He was God. And he didn't consider that something to be held on to, but he made himself nothing. It says he, he didn't count equality with God a thing to be held on to, but he'd emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. God came into the world, born in the likeness of men, being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. See, God loved the world so much, even though we were sinners, even though we had broken God's law, that he came down, he became a human being, and then he loved us enough to give his life and die on the cross for our sins. But how does that work? How do we receive it? Do we earn our way to him? No, it's not what we do for God that saves us. It's what he did for us by coming, by giving his life. And what is faith? Faith is that I love you because you loved me with everything you are. You love me first. That's what John says. We love him because he loved us first. So how does faith operate? We'll end with uh, Romans chapter, not, chapter 10. You have a Bible? Turn to Romans 10. Starting in verse 1, brothers, he says, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they would be saved. Everybody say saved. <clears throat> my heart's desire is that they would be saved. He's talking about the Jewish people, his brethren. He was Jewish. And they lived according to the law. He says, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God, they seek to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. When you think you can make it on your own, when you can establish your own righteousness apart from God, that's your own works. That will puff you up. That will make you into a Pharisee. And the Bible says you can't find salvation that way. You can't pay back the debt. How do we then, how are we going to be saved then? How do we receive righteousness? How do we become right with God based on the law? Well, he says here, they were seeking to establish their own righteousness, and they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ, that is Jesus, he is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So when Paul says that righteousness is by faith, the way that we receive righteousness from God, right standing with God and the forgiveness of our sins, is by believing so faith is trusting and believing in what God has done for you in Christ. That's what faith in him is. It is believing and trusting with your life, with everything. Not in yourself. We can't look at ourselves and go, I trust what I, you know, I'm a good person. You ask any alcoholic, are you a good person? Yeah, I'm a good person. Ask any adulterer, are you a good person? Yeah, I'm a good person. I help the poor. I do this, I do that. We always justify ourselves. We always try to justify ourselves. And the Bible says, no, you can't do that. There's too great a debt, and what you do is believe and have faith. Look what it says in Romans 10, 9. Paul says this is how it operates. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, see, confession and belief from the heart That God 
that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Everybody say saved. For with the heart, one believes and is made righteous. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved apart from the works of the law so that no one can boast in themselves. It's a free gift. Salvation is a free gift. This is how faith operates. It's not about believing something you know, that you can't see or that you can't test. That's, that's not what faith means. It's not about a leap of faith as if you can't do any research or find out if this is true. This is what the faith means in the Bible, okay? You, have, you are a patient and you have a cancer and that cancer is a tumor in your body and if that cancer is not dealt with, if you do not have a doctor deal with that cancer, you will certainly die. And sin is the cancer that is killing us. Sin is the destroyer that is killing us. Here's how faith operates. You go to a doctor. Why do you trust that doctor? Because he has the credentials. There's evidences that this person is qualified to deal with your sin. They make the right assessment. They can tell you this is what's going on with you. This is what's going on in your life. This is the thing that's killing you. This is the disease, and this is the treatment. And then what do you do with the doctor? Do you, do you help perform the surgery? No, you get on the table. Sometimes they put you to sleep. You don't do anything, and you trust yourself. You entrust yourself. And believing in Jesus is about entrusting yourself to him. Faith in Jesus. Righteousness is by faith and not by works. Let's stand up. We're done. We're done. Sorry, guys. I went a little bit long. We're going to close our eyes, bow our heads. If you have never trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to do that. I'm not going to make you do anything. I'm not going to make you come up. I just want everybody to close their eyes, bow their heads. I'm not even going to make you raise your hand. I just want to invite you right now to put your faith and your trust in Jesus, that he died for your sins. It's not by what you can do. You're not saved by becoming a good person. You're saved because... God acted, God came, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It's a gift and it's received by faith. And so if you want to trust Jesus and give him your sins so that he can give you his righteousness, I just invite you to do that. Say, Jesus, in your own heart, with your own mouth, Jesus, I trust you. Jesus, I trust you as my Lord. I trust you as my Savior, that you died for my sins. Everything else I counted as loss, like the, like the woman, the sinful woman who took the alabaster flask and broke it and poured it out at your feet. Lord, I do that with my life. All my sin and even the things that I boast in, Lord, I just take all of that and I throw it at your feet and I say, it's only through you. I trust you now to save me and forgive me and make me right with God. Amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not try Yeah.